The following video deals with some pretty heavy topics, including but not limited to those listed on screen here. So, if those are likely to be triggering for you, this might not be the video for you. In December of 2022, popular Twitch streamer and YouTuber Moist Critical challenged his audience and the internet in general to speedrun a game called Amok Runner. Now, up until this point, it's uh, conceivable that he may have been the only person <laughs> to have played this game, or if not the only person, it was a very small number. But in his own words, I'm living in this delusional fantasy where Amok Runner has potential to be a great speedrun game. I just have this gut feeling that there's great glitches in tech that can push this game to a really enjoyable level. I played the game shortly after that with the idea of potentially speedrunning it. I thought it'd be cool to get in on this challenge and quickly realized that I did not have the time or the energy or the patience to try to speedrun this game. It turned out to be a horrendous game to speedrun. The two major skips um, that really cut down on time were basically solely based on RNG. One of them was much more consistent. The other one was just you roll the dice and you hope you roll a 20. Kind of a horrendous speedrun. But in addition to that, it was just honestly a horrendous game. I played the game on stream, not trying to speedrun it. I was just curious as to what the game looked like, what it was about, uh, how it played, and man was that an experience. Over the course of playing the game, I couldn't help but notice the loading screens. And the loading screens are interesting because they contain quotes all from the same guy, Stefan Zweig, and I didn't recognize the name, but I thought it was interesting that they uh, kept quoting this guy. And all the quotes looked like pretty unhinged, pretty nonsensical, um, mostly just due to being translated poorly. But then I got to the end and it says, based on the book by Stefan Zweig. I'm like, oh, okay. Now something's starting to make sense here. Now my initial thought was that this guy Zweig was maybe a contemporary author who thought he was all that, self-published this book and uh, then just like made a game to promote it or something something that that was that was my initial thought well that couldn't be further from the truth but no actually i was shocked to learn that actually zweig was a really popular celebrated author in his time around the 1920s and 30s primarily and so it's like okay okay hold on hold on i just played a game with the most stupid nonsensical plot imaginable how was this based on a book by a popular author in his time, right? Well, it turns out the answer is a kind of overwhelming tone deafness on the part of the developers, possibly a lack of understanding of the source material, and certainly a lack of decent translation. Maybe the German version isn't quite so horrendous. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I don't speak German. This video will be focusing just on the English version as that's all I really know. So I found out that this book was actually written almost a hundred years ago now and was actually popular at the time. So it's like, okay, okay, okay. I gotta know what it was about, like what it was like in its original form before they butchered it for this horrendous game, right? So I read this book, um, which incidentally, I specifically read the translation by Anthea Bell. So if you're reading in English, I highly recommend her translation. It's very good. So I was actually very pleasantly surprised to find that the original book, Amok by Stefan Zweig, is really well written. It's a pretty interesting story. The prose is beautifully crafted, which partly thanks to Anthea Bell for that in the English version. And the characters' motivations and choices, while in many cases not being any more rational than in the game, make a lot more sense for the characters as they're presented. So I wanted to take a look at the book today and go over it, see why it works, 
and compare it to why the video game doesn't work and maybe try and speculate on how the video game could have been done a little bit better so as to I don't think you could make a good game out of this, but perhaps you could make a mediocre game out of this. So the story in the book is told within the frame of our main character, the Doctor, telling his story to the narrator character. So we start off with our narrator, who is not our main character, telling us that this strange event happened. And I don't remember the year, he specifies the year this ship is being unloaded in Naples Harbor, and a strange event happens. And he didn't see it personally, but he thinks he knows what it was or why it happened. He doesn't elaborate on that. He just says, I can explain why that, why that happened. We cut to he is traveling from East Asia back to Europe by ocean liner. And he meets this dude. One night he's up on the deck when everyone else is like asleep. He goes up on deck to look at the stars. And over in this little secluded darkened corner, he meets this completely hinged and normal character known as the Doctor. And the Doctor uh, feels the need to tell his story to someone because he hasn't spoken to anyone in so long and he just, he feels that he needs to get his story out and like not get it out. He actually doesn't want the narrator to tell anyone. He just needs to get some stuff off his chest, right? So he begins telling us this story and it becomes apparent very quickly that this guy is, how do I put this politely, a violently racist, misogynistic piece of crap. So he t gives us a brief overview of his backstory. He was a really successful doctor in Germany until his career and reputation were totally destroyed, and rightly so because he fell in love with a patient and on her behalf stole a bunch of money from the hospital he worked at. And he only avoided jail time because he had a relative high up somewhere who was able to uh, get him out of trouble, but he, he pretty much had to get out of the country at that point. Later on, he finds out that the Dutch government is looking for doctors to send to their colonies in East Asia, and I believe it's Malaysia specifically, and they're offering a huge sum of money up front for this and then pension after, and it's uh, for a term of 10 years. So he signs on for that, and he goes to the jungles, and we, uh, get to listen to a whole bunch of racist rant from him about how horrible things are over there in the jungle. Not just because it's the jungle and it's humid and crap, but he goes into a lot about how he doesn't like being around people that don't look like him, and it's great. It's such a good look for this guy. This is not a chill dude. This is not a reasonable or well-adjusted dude. And we kind of, we clearly get that impression right off the bat. It's kind of the point of the story. So right off the bat, we have a pretty good expectation of what kind of character this is and what kind of attitudes and behavior we can reasonably expect from him, which is that he's a lousy, crappy character and he does lousy, crappy things. Which I also noticed the author seems to go out of his way to kind of distance himself and us, the readers, from this character. There's a couple of scenes from the narrator's perspective before he meets the doctor where he's describing the cabin that he got on the ship and he's describing like the stars at night when he's up there stargazing before he meets the doctor. And it's this really just beautiful kind of almost like visceral like very descriptive very graphic prose where you can you can't just imagine you can feel and you can smell and you can taste like the grease in the in the air on his cabin and like the sea breeze as he's out there stargazing like it's immersive prose right and then the doctor starts talking and he's describing the jungle and he's like it was horrible it was bad it was jungly there there weren't any white people out there it was awful <laughs> 
there appears to be, in my opinion, a very deliberate effort on Zweig's part to separate himself from this lousy character because he's a bad person. And the point of the story is not that he's not a bad person, it's actually that he is a bad person. That's that's a big part of the story. So with that Pulitzer Prize winning description of the jungle and how non-white it is, we begin the actual body of our narrative, wherein the doctor is visited in his secluded clinic in the jungle by a European woman, and he is shocked to meet someone of European descent out here, you know, this far in the wilderness. And she comes into his office, or his clinic, and they go up to his office, and the interaction here I also want to draw attention is very well crafted. There's this really well-written, like, nuanced kind of very tense interaction between the two where she comes in and is just talking his ear off about nothing. She's like, oh, oh, it's so nice out here. I love all the books you have and stuff, and it's uh, blah, 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 and she just babbles on and on and on. And he's just sitting here trying to figure out what the heck she wants, you know, because clearly she came here for some reason. Uh, he describes that they're eight hours away from civilization by train. So she was not just passing by, which she literally says, I was just passing by. No, you weren't. So eventually it comes out that she is three months pregnant, just about, and her husband has been overseas for almost five months. And so, needless to say, she doesn't want that to be found out about, particularly by her husband. So, she would like the doctor to make it not that way, which, at the time, and particularly in that place, this is a very, very dangerous and very, very illegal medical procedure, right? Now, it's stated that there are certain circumstances where it is acceptable in that time and place. And so she tells him, all right, well, you're a doctor. You're going to find those circumstances to have been the case. So she's you know, just basically blatantly asking him to do this illegal thing and then lie about it in the legal paperwork and is offering him this huge sum of money to do it that'll make up for him losing his pension um, because she's also asking him to skip town immediately after doing that, which we're eight years into his 10-year term at this point, by the way. So at this point, we already kind of know that the doctor is a pretty messed up dude, but at this point, he takes it to a whole other level. He pulls us out of the narrative. He interrupts his own story to be like, okay, look, narrator, you got to understand something. You need to understand the context here because what I'm about to say sounds really awful, you know, but but you got to understand the context. The context that he explains to the narrator is that he didn't like her attitude, like she was acting all proud and full of herself and it made him angry. So therefore he wanted to humiliate her, I, I guess, kind of put her in her place, right? Uh, so that's the context for what he asks for next. And basically what he says to her is, well, I can't do it for that amount. And she's like, okay, well, what, how, what will you do it for? And he's like, well, I won't do it for money, but, uh, you know, maybe there's something else you could help me with. So you're saying you don't want to do this? No, uh, I don't. Not for money, at least. What else could you possibly want? I'm not just a doctor. I don't just spend my hours examining patients. I have my own private life apart from all that. And maybe... You've happened to come just in time for that. And if you aren't picking up on what he's saying, I I'm sorry, but I'm not going to explain it any more clearly than that. So, yeah, that's that's where he goes with that. So, needless to say, she's kind of shocked and horrified by this and immediately storms out and tells him not to follow her. 
Um, so, of course, he decides to do the rational, reasonable thing and follow her, right? Because he needs to apologize for his behavior, right? That's, that, that's, that's the normal well-adjusted thing to do in that situation right oh wait maybe the maybe the normal well-adjusted thing to do is not put yourself in that situation in the first place ah i'm sure it's fine so he does the normal well-adjusted thing and runs down to his bike shed realizes he forgot the key to his bike shed so naturally he doesn't go back for it he just rips the door off its hinges grabs his bike and gets going he catches up to her on the road to the train station and she's walking back with her servant, who is a local boy, right? So she sees him coming and sends the boy back to try to stop him. And she runs on ahead to try to catch the train or whatever. Actually, she might have driven there. She might have had a car. So we get into this lovely altercation where the doctor expresses just his overwhelming indignance that... A non-white person would dare to lay hands on him, you know, because he's so freaking important. Um, yeah, it gets pretty disgusting, and I don't care to repeat any of his dialogue from those scenes because it's just, it's, it makes me angry. But anyway, so he gets in a fight with the kid, and manages to fight him off but realizes that in their altercation his bike got uh like bent up so he can't use it anymore so he naturally he throws it at the kid and then goes on his way well he doesn't catch up to the woman anyway but he finds out from people at the train station who she is because like the the colony there is small enough that kind of everybody sort of knows everybody else and so he's able to find out about her which he doesn't know everybody else because he never goes into the the main colony town he just stays out here in the jungle so the doctor interrupts himself yet again to explain uh some more context that's very important we understand uh why he behaved the way he did so there's a thing called the amok sickness that will sometimes happen in this area and from what I can tell from a little bit of research, I wasn't able to find very much on this topic, but apparently what he says here is based in reality. Apparently it is a thing that does happen, but I wasn't able to find very much on it. It's just kind of, yeah, this is where this word comes from. But as far as I can tell, most of what he says next is accurate. Basically, this amok sickness Sometimes a dude is just chilling somewhere, drinking alcohol or something. It seems to be related to alcohol consumption, but it's like it's it's not really alcohol poisoning. It doesn't behave the same way, so nobody can really figure out what it is. But he's just chilling there drinking. All of a sudden, he'll get up and he'll just run and he'll just keep running. He'll grab his knife before he goes running, I guess and he will just murder anything that stands in his way. And so the local word for it is a muck. And so people will yell when they see one of these guys coming, they'll yell ahead of him, a muck, a muck, so that everybody knows to get the frick out of the way because this lunatic's just going through. He's going to stab you if you get in his way. And he just keeps on running until he collapses from exhaustion or he gets shot by somebody or something. So he describes this sickness, and then he's like, that's exactly what happened to me just now, at this point in the story. And that's totally believable, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then describes how he uh, went back to his house, got his revolver, went to the train station, bought a ticket, got on a train, rode on a train for eight hours, went down and like found the address of the woman he was looking for, and went 
to the front door and talk to the servant and ask to see her. You know exactly the same thing as the, the insane homicidal rampage he just described, you know, happening with other people affected by this thing. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. Um, so that justifies everything that happens after that, right? R right? So anyway, there's this really long bit in the middle of the story that I don't really want to get into. It's not that nothing happens, but you don't really need it to understand what follows. Basically, he just kind of hangs out in town for the next couple of days, trying to get in contact with her, creeping around her house, weird stuff like that. And his whole idea is he wants to apologize to her and offer to do the procedure that she asked him to in the first place. So eventually he manages to get an, a letter through to her, basically saying, look, I'm really sorry, I, I'm willing to do the thing, let me know by like tonight or I'm gonna shoot myself. And she just barely lets him know by tonight, but uh, what she writes back is just simply, no. No, you are not forgiven and you're not going to be, but stick around for the moment because I might need you later. And he's like, okay, that's kind of weird, but all right. So he sticks around and he chills there and the servant shows up at his hotel room and doesn't really speak English very well or German or whatever it is they're speaking, but communicates that like they need to go like right now to this place. So he leads the doctor to this really rundown, poor district of town where they find out this woman has gone to try to get the procedure done by somebody who is not qualified to be doing it at all. And so she's been grievously injured and she's bleeding out now. So the doctor's like, okay, look, we need to get you to the hospital like immediately, right? And the woman's like, no. No, 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 I would rather die than uh, be disgraced with people finding out about this. And he's like, sounds reasonable, okay. So instead they take her to her house and we have this excruciating scene where the doctor and the servant just sit there in the bedroom for six hours while she slowly bleeds to death. And it's actually a really well-written scene, but man, okay. So next morning, the city doctor comes in, the guy who's uh, basically our doctor's superior, and they're kind of rivals because during that long, slow bit in the middle of the story, he also applied to be transferred into the city and have somebody else go out into the jungle where he was stationed. So this guy thinks that our doctor is, you know, gunning for his job right but he comes in to write up the death certificate and all that and the doctor's like no no you're not you're not gonna examine the body and the guy's like um yes i am what what do you mean and the guy's like no because i promised her that i would keep the cause of death a secret so you're going to make something up he's like no no i'm not that would be falsifying a legal document i've never done that and i'm not going to and the doctor actually doesn't have his revolver on him, but he successfully bluffs and pretends to. And he's like, okay, look, you're going to falsify the death certificate. You're not going to examine the body. In return, not only will I not shoot you, but I will skip town at the very earliest opportunity. The guy's like, okay, fine. We'll go with that. Because the whole time up to that point, he thinks that the doctor is trying to, like, you know, take his job or something. So that's like, okay, fine. If it'll get rid of you, so he does. We also, and it's not super important, but it does happen, and it is important that it happens. The doctor also meets the father of the dead woman's child later that day. And he actually camps out in that guy's apartment for the next couple days while he's trying to get out of the country because, like, the police are looking for him. So that, that happens. So he gets on this ship going back to Europe. And as he's getting on the ship, he sees the woman's coffin being loaded onto the ship. And he's like, oh, crap. They're probably taking that back to England to do an autopsy. That would be bad. I promised her I would keep that a secret. So gotta do something about that. 
and that is pretty much the end of that story we go back to our narrator who doesn't see the doctor again after that night after he's told his story and all of that but then later he gets to okay so then we get back to the strange event i mentioned at the beginning of the story the strange event was that they were unloading this coffin from the ship and some lunatic jumped off the ship onto the coffin causing everyone that was moving the coffin to fall into the bay along with the, the coffin and they all survived but whoever jumped was never seen again and the coffin wasn't found because it was at the bottom of the the harbor right and then it, he also mentions as an aside yeah a body washed up on the shore later that was probably our doctor so yeah that is a muck by Stefan Zweig, and overall it left a much better impression than the game. It was a decently interesting story, very interesting character, and I say interesting, that has that is not a word that I assign any moral value to. He's a terrible person, he's a disgusting character, but he's interesting. You see the, the distinction there. I kind of do wonder if there is some kind of specific form of mental illness or neurosis that's being emulated by this character because obviously his comparison that he makes to the amok sickness is completely stupid it's it's just him trying to justify his horrendous actions right that's not a real thing i wonder if there is something he's emulating specifically because like i know there are people with like personality disorders characterized in particular by just rampant obsession with things or with specific things or people, but the very sudden onset of that obsession for this character in particular is interesting to say the least. I, I, I'm not really qualified to speak on it too much more than that, honestly. I do appreciate that Zweig does not shy away from the idea of writing a story from the perspective of this deeply deeply just disturbed, messed up character. Like, if you met him in real life, you would hate him. He's the worst. But it's an interesting story, and it wouldn't work with a less psychotic character. And at the same time, he manages to write it without appearing to, like, condone such actions or anything like that. It's, it's very clear that the author doesn't place any moral value on the doctor's actions or his attempts at justification for himself and he puts that narrative distance like i described where it's clear that you're not supposed to relate to this guy and having been born in austria around the turn of the 20th century to jewish parents i feel like zweig of all people probably understood that racism is bad here's a picture of his name in the infamous black book one thing in particular that I really notice in contrast to the game is that most, if not all, of the choices the characters make and the dialogue uh, spoken in the book makes perfect sense in context. Now that doesn't mean any of it's okay, but it makes sense if you consider the mental state of the character um, doing those actions or saying those things as opposed to the game where that isn't really as much the case. But yeah, overall, pretty good book. I, I would say it holds up decently well. I would honestly recommend it. Do be aware if you are going to read this. I've glossed over an incredible amount of just insufferable racism from the doctor because it's just disgusting and I didn't want to get into it. So yeah, if that's a problem for you, you may not want to get into this book, but it's it's a pretty short read and it is interesting. So yeah. So the game is a little different from that. I'm sure you may have noticed I've harped a lot on the tone of the book and how it's made clear that you're not really supposed to relate to the main character. Well, the game doesn't know how to do that. It doesn't seem to be aware that you should need to do that. 
if you haven't read the book, and even if you have read the book, you play as the doctor. So you're inside his head the whole time. You don't really get access to too much of his internal thoughts and like feelings about his situation. And even when you do, there is no acting. There is no emotion. The, the voice actor is frankly terrible. There's no effort put into it whatsoever. You see this face? This guy right here, that's all you get for the whole game. He doesn't emote at all. There's, there's no expression whatsoever. So maybe I should have. But I didn't figure out, having not read the book, that this guy was supposed to be a bad character. It's obvious from his actions that he's supposed to be a bad character. But that's my problem, is there's this dissonance between the tone of the game, the attitude the game takes towards what you're doing and what you're supposed to do, and the actual actions of the guy you're playing as. So I kind of have a huge problem with that. But we'll get into some of the more of the detail of that in a little bit. Starting off, the game gives us basically no context as to where we are, who we are, what's going on, none of that. Here's what we get. Okay. Off the Indian Ocean, March 25th, 1935. Do you mean off the coast of India? Thank Every day. Oh. Exactly the same. I'm having the worst nightmares till morning. Okay. Another sleepless day begins. Uh, okay. Very cool. Yeah, riveting stuff there, I know. So anyway, you're told to go explore the ship, you walk over here, you happen to sit on this bench, and you've just met the book's protagonist. And now your player character, the Doctor, is going to tell his story. So, of course, we uh, teleport directly to his clinic with no context as to who he is, where he came from, how he got there. Nah. Nah. It's just, here he is at his clinic. Now, I have so many problems with this scene. Just to start, the clinic, and the entire game for that matter, is all in the same city. There's none of this being off in the jungle in the wilderness. No, the doctor's clinic is right across the river from the hospital. And despite that, the woman's dialogue, which she's named in the game for some reason, her name's Linda, Linda's dialogue is lifted directly from the book. So she makes reference to him living out in the wilderness like a hermit, but he's right here in the middle of town across the river from the hospital. What's up with that? They also make up some dialogue from the doctor trying to, I guess, kind of gloss over his rampant racism and just kind of explain that it's surprising that she showed up at his clinic. But they choose to do this just simply with the line, with no context, Linda comes into the clinic and to himself he's like, A lady in this town? And this is supposed to communicate... I'm not sure that it's unusual for an English woman to be here, but that doesn't make sense because she's in the same town. She lives in this town. Um, this is like the Dutch colony, so it makes sense that there would be Europeans here. So they take the conversation then uh, between Linda and the doctor and almost word for word, sentence for sentence, just copy paste it from the book, except they cut out huge swaths of the dialogue that would have provided some context. They cut out all of the narration because there's no narration. They cut out all of that that would have given context that would have made the interaction make sense. And it doesn't work the way they do it, partially because there's no voice acting. They, they can't express emotion for whatever reason. So this really stilted, awkward interaction is happening, right? And then just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he comes out with this request, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, of her. And she reasonably storms out, but then the game is like, follow her. 
and, and it's like from the lack of emotion in the voice acting and the quest log telling me what to do it really feels like the game thinks the doctor's actions are reasonable because it's like, I, as the player, have no reason to want to follow her in this situation. I'm just sitting here in shock at what my character just, like, just said. And the game's like, oh yeah, no, just follow her. And I'm like, what? Why? 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 But yeah, the game seems to think that the doctor's actions are somehow reasonable and... We don't really get a sense from the doctor's perspective either that he realizes he's not behaving like a decent human being. Unlike the book where he tries to justify and explain away everything, but he acknowledges that what he did and said was, you know, awful. In the game we get this. Where the heck are we? Suppressed myself poorly. As a doctor, I should have helped. I must catch up and apologize. Ye <laughs> expressed yourself poorly is a polite way of putting it, to say the least. We then go to the train station to hunt her down, right? Well, you might be wondering, why is she going to the train station when she's already in the town where she lives? I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know where she goes like later later on she's she's in the same town so I, I don't know where she was taking a train to it appears to go out of town but then she comes right back I don't know I don't know so you might think that since we're in a town and this woman lives in the same town and it's a pretty small town and everybody kind of knows each other you might either already know who she is or be able to reasonably find out. Just ask someone and find out pretty quickly. Well, no, actually, we're going to find out her identity because her face is just on a poster in the train station for some reason. And she's not like an actress or a celebrity or anything. She's just the wife of a wealthy, like, merchant or something. But, um, yeah that happens so then we get this really bizarre series of quest lines where you have to go to this one house that used to belong to the family that, that she's from and you break into the house for some reason and you steal a revolver because the game decided you needed one even though the doctor in the book owns a revolver and then you find out that the house is actually abandoned i guess and actually this family lives over here now on the other side of town so you go there and break into that house find a journal entry of linda's is spelling out that the child she's carrying is illegitimate because i guess they figured some people would be as stupid as me and not have put that together they didn't explain it too well but this was not the way to do that in my opinion he then has to break back out of the mansion because the door's locked behind him when he came in or something i i don't know and he meets up with linda's servant who can drive in this version of reality. How did he know that I would be just randomly breaking into her home? I've been looking for you everywhere. It occurred to me that you might be in the mansion. Why would I do, why was I doing that? The whole reason for the breaking into the houses appears to have been to find out why she wanted an abortion, but you don't really need to explain that. It's kind of intuitively obvious from the context. The part I didn't pick up from the conversation between her and the doctor was that she wanted an abortion. I didn't understand what she was asking for. Once I realized that, it's like, oh yeah, that's obvious. But the, the, this doctor has to break into two houses in order to learn why she wants an abortion. So yeah. So you make it to this dirty, rundown, abandoned ruin of a clinic where she went to get this operation. And I, I don't know, I guess like a ghost operated on her or something because there's no one there. And she bleeds out and dies in the clinic while you're looking for morphine because the game felt the need to give you a little quest to do. I need to hurry. 
she's dying. Morphine isn't gonna stop her from dying. What, what the actual heck? Now, I don't think this story was particularly well suited to a game adaptation. It's just not the type of story that works for that well. But I do want to read this scene from the book just to illustrate how little effort was put into adapting it into a game. And I think, I think this is probably the most egregious example of that. Do you know, stranger, sitting here so casually in your deck chair, traveling at leisure around the world, do you know what it's like to watch someone dying? Have you ever been at a deathbed? Have you ever seen the body contort, blue nails scrabbling at the empty air while breath rattles in the dying throat? Every limb fights back, every finger is braced against the terror of it, and the eye stares into horror for which there are no words. Have you ever experienced that idle tourist that you are, you who call it a duty to help? As a doctor, I've often seen it, seen it as, as a clinical case, a fact. I have studied it, so to speak, but I experienced it only once, there with her. I died with her that night, that dreadful night, when I sat there racking my brains to think of something, some way to staunch the blood that kept on flowing, soothe the fever consuming her before my eyes, ward off death as it came closer and closer, and I couldn't keep it from her bed. Can you guess what it means to be a doctor, to know how to combat every illness, to feel the duty of helping, as you so sagely put it, and yet to sit helpless by a dying woman, knowing what is happening but powerless, just knowing the one terrible truth that there is nothing you can do. Although you would open every vein in your own body for her, watching a beloved body lead miserably to death in agonizing pain, feeling a pulse that flutters and grows faint, ebbing away under your fingers, to be a doctor yet know of nothing, nothing, Nothing you can do, just sitting there stammering out some kind of prayer, like a little old lady in church, shaking your fist in the face of a merciful God who you know doesn't exist. Can you understand that? Can you understand it? There's just one thing I don't understand myself. How? How a man can manage not to die too at such moments but wake from sleep the next morning, clean his teeth, put on a tie, go on living, when he's experienced what I felt as her breath failed, as the first human being for whom I was really wrestling, fighting, whom I wanted to keep alive with all the force of my being, as she slipped away from me to somewhere else, faster, faster, minute after minute, and my feverish brain could do nothing to keep that one woman alive. Which, sure, the doctor's a little melodramatic, and my reading of it is eh. But in the game, we get this incredible sequence. Now, the interaction between the two doctors here isn't too egregious. The only real problems I have are the lousy voice acting and the fact that our doctor appears to ask this guy to just buy the boat tickets for him for some reason, which not only does he do, but they teleport to his house for some reason. So that's weird. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's vibe. It's whatever. We then get this really odd bit of dialogue that was actually almost directly taken from the book. Behind okay. the house I've been working on for seven years, everything I, I have, I, I cannot stay here any longer in this house, in this town, in this world where everything reminds me of her. What? You do her for like five minutes. What the heck is this? 
but once again it's like it was just about the right amount of unhinged for the character we know from the book so then the police chase you for some reason as you're leaving your house because i guess the doctor the other doctor called the police on you for murdering linda or something which you didn't actually do but the police are chasing you now and oh boy are they willing to cause so much property damage and loss of human life in order to apprehend this one doctor that might have killed someone or committed malpractice or something now you might be thinking as i did why would they not intercept him as he's trying to get on the ship good question so you successfully evade the police, and then, suddenly, out of nowhere, you have to fight this guy. Oh, frick. I, I completely forgot to mention there are zombies in this game. There are zombies in this game, by the way. They don't do anything. They have no effect on the plot. They show up sometimes when the game decides that it's time for you to do the shooty-shoot thing. So this guy shows up because it's time for you to do the shooty-shoot thing. And then you shoot him, and that's it. And then you go to the ship, and the police don't stop you from getting on the ship. So here you are at the end of the flashback. So at that point, it's been about five hours since Linda died, and they've got her in a coffin, and they're loading her onto the ship to send her to England for an autopsy for some reason. It's not implied that her husband is involved, which he's the one who sent it to England for an autopsy in the book. I'm not sure who made this call, but it's on the ship, and the doctor somehow didn't know about it, but our narrator character, whom we've been telling this story to, did see a coffin get loaded onto the ship, so he's like, hey, that's probably her. And you're like, oh frick, that is her. I, I can tell. I'd better go dump that coffin in the ocean. Well, somebody's conveniently loaded it up on, onto this weird wooden shelf thing on the edge of the, the ship, so it's really super easy, barely an inconvenience to do. Oh, and also, on your way over there, there's this weird hallucination dream thing you have, and then the doctor to himself, like, has this bit of dialogue. Wait a minute, isn't, like, his entire motivation at this point that no one can find out about, like, why she died? He took her from us. Now she belongs to that man again. She doesn't belong to us anymore. To us. To... to both of us. Okay, can you shut up with your incoherent rambling? I was in the middle of a thought. Okay. Which references a character who doesn't exist in the game, or doesn't appear in the game anyway, who appeared in the book. Remember I said that was going to be significant later? We also, and it's not super important, but it does happen, and it is important that it happens, the doctor also meets the father of the dead woman's child. So that having happened, and the coffin's in the ocean now, and the doctor also jumps into the ocean because of reasons, game's over. That's the game. So most of the game mechanics aren't too egregious. I'll pretty much just skip over them for now and get to them in the next section where I fix them. The combat, I feel like, kind of need their own explanation as to why they don't work before I can get into fixing them. The combat is incredibly bad for so many reasons. To name just a few, you're always trying to shoot at guys who are running at you with knives. They move faster than you can really kind of aim. Y you have to sight with the gun in order to shoot. Time it takes to transition in and out of the sight is really long. Your movement speed, and particularly your turn speed when you're sighting, is really slow. The bad guys can strafe around you faster than you can turn while sighting. And by the time you sight, after adjusting to turn towards them, they've strafed around you again. Sighting also zooms in significantly, which is fine at range, but these enemies don't stay at range for any meaningful amount of time. So unless you headshot them, 
every time and manage to kill all of them as quickly as possible, you're going to get swarmed by people who are just rotating around your field of view infinitely faster than you can keep up. Also, this isn't really a criticism of the combat, but there's this weird thing where you can like go out of your way at certain points in the game to acquire these boxes of ammo. And you appear, as far as I can tell, you have infinite ammo regardless of whether you do this. So I'm not really sure why those exist. So yeah, just in terms of the game's mechanics, it seems pretty clear to me that little to no effort was put into any aspect of the game or the gameplay or anything. And it really shows and it's really just depressing to experience. As for the story in the game, it's really bad. The characters' choices make no sense, or they're just not explained at all because a lot of the choices are the same. They made sense in the book, but they're not explained in the book. The story is really poorly structured. It's poorly told. There are zombies for no freaking reason. And a lot of aspects of the story are just haphazardly copy-pasted from the book with no thought to all of the changes of the context they made. You can't just have your player character sexually harass someone without the player meaning for that to happen or understanding why it would even and just give no explanation as to why the game is just like, yup, this is normal, this is what we're doing. And like no explanation as to why the player is just supposed to go along with this. Why? That's not okay. And another thing, the zombies are garbage. There's no point to them. There's no freaking point to them. They have no role in the story. They, they, there's no reason for them to be there. They do nothing except like have there be combat now and then. And it's... So even if the story were good and made sense, the presentation, the dialogue, the voice acting, it's awful. The translation is lazy at best. I, I honestly don't think there were any English speakers, like native English speakers, who worked on this game, which that's fine. You can make a perfectly good game and translate it without necessarily having anyone doing the localization who natively speaks the language you're localizing it to. That can be done. It's not done here. Not well, anyway. There's a staggering amount of lines of dialogue that are just copied verbatim from the book, and they don't have any regard for the fact that they've completely changed the context. And this leads to a really interesting phenomenon that I experienced playing the game first, which is that a lot of the dialogue obviously is very bad, but what was interesting about it is some of the worst offenders, some of the most egregious examples of just trash dialogue, just horribly written stuff, actually turned out to be some of the best dialogue in the book. And it was exactly the same word for word, the same sentences being spoken as what was in the book. But it's the changed context, or... Worse yet, it's just the completely flat delivery that makes it the worst dialogue in the game. They weren't working with bad source material. They just were incompetent. They didn't know how to to use it. I just can't get over like how bad of a character the Doctor is in the game. And I don't mean like bad, like morally bad, like he's a piece of crap, which he is in both versions. I mean, he's just, as a character, he's just badly done. And most of the time, it's just simply because his voice actor is seemingly, like, incapable of expressing any kind of emotion. I mean, just look at this, look at, look, look at this guy. I would like to ask you something. Actually, to tell you something. I know how absurd it is to tell this to the first person I've just met, but I... I am in such a state that I definitely need to talk to someone, or, or I will be ruined. So basically, with the zombies, I promise I'm not even making this up, they took this idea of the amok sickness, which as I've described is, uh, appears to be a real historical phenomenon, and they were just like, oh. That sounds kind of neat, but what if instead we were just like, oh yeah, it's a communicable disease that 
makes you a zombie. It's a zombie virus. What if we did it that way? And so they did it that way. So that that's it. It's no deeper than that, and it doesn't affect the story. Also, they take away the whole thing of the doctor running amok, which is like his entire claim to justifying what he's doing. They're just like, no, no. No, instead, we're going to have it be a zombie virus, and we're going to avoid having to try to explain why the doctor's behaving this way by, I guess, just kind of gaslighting our players and pretending that this is normal. And we'll see how that goes. It did not go well. It did not go well. First, I feel like I kind of have to ask, okay, we're trying to fix this game. Can we do that? Is it possible to fix this game? And I think the answer is maybe. Because looking at this game, a lot of the aspects of what make it so insufferable is just the fact that little to no effort appears to have been put in on the part of the devs, the voice actors, the writers, the translation, all of that. So a lot of this section is just going to be, um, do better, do your jobs better. And that's kind of a shallow criticism, but at the same time, that's a huge huge part of what makes this game so bad. The other problem that's a bit deeper and a bit harder to fix is the story. What do we do with the story? Because it's not a story that you look at and you can see a clear path to adapting this to an interactive medium. It's just not. It doesn't make sense to try to do this. I mean, you look at, okay, so in the original story, there's very little in the way of like combat or like puzzles or anything that could challenge the player reasonably. There's not too much. There's there's a couple of altercations as far as combat is concerned. But they decided, oh, there needs to be, you know, we need to do the shooty shoot thing. So zombies. There's not really a mystery or plot threads to unravel, which is evident from the fact that they made the entire mystery element of it be find out why she wanted an abortion. Well, that, that's kind of obvious. You don't need to find that out. But that's what you have to do, because they needed something for you to do. And then third and probably the biggest problem with adapting this story is that the protagonist character, the main character, is meant to be disliked by the reader. His actions are completely irrational, they're often evil, and that's kind of the point of the book. If you give the player agency to change any of those irrational evil choices, none of the story happens, no nothing works. The story happens because of those choices. But on the other hand, if you don't give the player that agency, well, then you're not making an interactive media, you're just railroading the player and just telling your story. And it's not even an interesting story because you've taken away all the aspects that make it interesting. So if I'm going to try to fix this scheme, I'm going to need to fundamentally change the story in some way so that the player can interact with it in some meaningful way. And that's not to say there can't be good games where the player doesn't have choices as to what path to take, but you shouldn't have a game like this where you're playing as this character and you're experiencing this story through this character where you can't relate to the character in any way. That doesn't work. You can write a story that works that way and have it be good. I, I don't think it carries over to a game. So I'm going to, in order to try to fix the story, so that it work can work for a game. I'm not trying to make my own game out of this story. I'm trying to take the game that exists and offer some constructive criticism as to how it could potentially become a worthwhile game. So I'm going to have to limit myself in a couple of ways so that it's still kind of recognizable as at least being inspired by Amok by Stefan Zweig. So for one thing, I'm not going to change any of the fundamental mechanics of the game itself. I'm going to leave it as roughly what I'm going to characterize as a third-person puzzle horror game with shooter elements. 
rate and it should stay roughly that throughout my attempts to fix it. The characters and the major story beats need to stay kind of the same. I'll probably break this rule, but they need to they need to have some similar it needs to be recognizable to some degree as far as the actual story as far as why those uh those story beats happen as far as why the characters interact the way they do i'm kind of gonna allow myself a lot of freedom there i'll probably break the second rule anyway so let's see how this goes so real quick, I kind of want to just go through here and describe what I would do differently with a lot of the game mechanics. So the walking, biking, driving, every way that the player gets around the map needs to suck less because they all suck horribly. Walking, I don't have a major problem with. It's just too slow and there's too much of it. So just speed it up or have there be less ground you have to cover without a ride of some kind, right? That's simple enough. Biking is the same speed as running except also you can just self-destruct the bike by bumping into an npc so speed it up and make it so it doesn't self-destruct and then it'll be fine driving is a big problem for several reasons it takes too long to get moving which might not be a huge issue if all the other stuff isn't that way there's too much in the map there's too many things that will just bring the car to a full stop instantly there's like i think a lot of like road signs and things i'm not sure on that one basically any terrain object that isn't specifically destructible and even a lot of them that are, like fences you're supposed to be able to drive right through, will bring you to a complete stop. They'll break, but they'll stop you. And especially if you watch the speed runs of the, uh, the police chase scene, there's way too much just RNG physics where sometimes the ground will interfere with your car and cause you to stop in the middle of a field for no reason. There's no consequences for just mowing down hordes of NPCs. They're kind of hard to hit, but it just kind of breaks the the world. This isn't really a gameplay problem. It's kind of funny, but it is weird. And also there's like no consequence for ramming the car into things. I, I know I just said that uh, I don't like that you come to a complete stop, but also it's a little weird that you can't destroy the car by crashing full speed into a concrete wall. But that's not really as big an issue as a lot of this other stuff. Another thing that's not really a big issue but annoyed me is that NPCs will like just defy the laws of physics to avoid getting hit by your car and your bike, but cars will just follow their set path and just ram into you head on if you don't get out of their way not a big deal just annoying the biggest issue with the car is the steering the steering i'm going to talk at length about a little bit because it's so bad and it is really hard to describe if you have not played the game you can't just look at it and see what's going on you have to experience it but i'll do my best to describe it basically when you press a or d if you're using mouse and keyboard if you press a or d to turn the wheel doesn't immediately turn and you don't immediately start turning the wheel begins to turn and continues to turn the longer you hold down that button and based on how far the wheels have turned the car will begin to make the turn you're trying to do but the wheels are very slow to turn when you press those buttons and when you release the button you don't stop turning the wheels begin to turn back to that center position so you continue to turn for a little while after you have released the button so the result is this extremely sluggish just awkward really needlessly difficult mechanic where basically what i figured out in order to steer reasonably like you would expect a normal game to function is you hold down say i want to turn right i'll hold down d for a little bit till the wheels are about halfway turned and then I will tap D repeatedly to keep the wheels in roughly that position for the duration of the turn and then stop tapping when I want to straighten out and it takes a little bit of finagling to get the uh, the timing right but that worked for me but that's stupid I shouldn't have to figure that out it should just work like it works in every other game that has had a car in it for the last 40 years. Why would you literally reinvent the wheel? Why would you do that? There's no reason for it, and it's bad, and no one likes it. It's bad.
don't do it. So the combat I'm going to focus on a little bit as well because I'm assuming for some reason that we want to keep the combat even though this game doesn't seem conducive to it. So first of all, the enemies have this stupid step dodge ability that I, I hopefully have some footage of that you're looking at right now. The thing is, they have iframes during this step dodge, but the iframes start before the dodge animation. They appear to start actually the same frame that you pull the trigger. So you can have them in your sights, pull the trigger, and they gain iframes at the moment that you pulled the trigger. Not to be a sore loser or anything, but did that attack just miss? That attack rewrites causality. My instincts and my luck, those skills together saved me. Well, that's dumb. My attack that will always pierce the heart was disrupted by a metaphysical critical role on a D20. The step dodge is just really broken, so it either needs to be balanced or just removed entirely. I would opt for removing entirely unless you want to make this a combat focused game, which I don't really get the impression that that's what they were going for. So yeah. Another garbage ability that needs to go away immediately is the enemy's ability to strafe around you at infinite speed once they get up close and personal with you. I should have some footage of that as well. Basically, they get up to you where they are in melee range, and they can slide left or right in circles around you faster than you can aim at them. And it's garbage, and it needs to stop. So I have some ideas for how to deal with that, but those ideas have more to do with the, uh, the way the gun works than they do with the uh, enemies themselves. The only other thing I'll say about the enemies is don't show me in a cutscene. oh, there are some enemies, it's time to fight now. No, have them jump out and scare me. This is supposed to be like, this feels like it wants to be like a horror game-esque kind of thing, if only a little bit. I feel like things should jump out and scare me more. So what I'd especially like to see in that frame is perhaps have the zombies come out and fight me indoors more often when I'm, uh, you know, crawling through these mansions, exploring, doing puzzles and stuff. Have there just be a jump scare where this thing comes out and I have to fight it. And that's also going to have to be balanced by my ideas about the gun here in a bit, because the gun needs to be balanced better for when these enemies get right up in your face. And I think one really good way to do that is just allow the player to fire the gun when you're not sighting, you know, shoot from the hip. This will reduce accuracy a lot, but that won't matter when the enemy is right there in your face. And it allows you to turn faster. You can turn to keep up with their strafing. So you don't even have to balance the strafing because that problem sorts itself out. Just allow the player to shoot without sighting. When you're not sighting, but the enemy's right up in your face, I would also say maybe, maybe optionally add like a fisheye effect so you have a bit better idea of where all the enemies are relative to you, but eh, I'm not super attached to that idea. I would also say potentially rebalance it a little so when you do sight, I think you already zoom in in the game when you sight, but maybe also slow time just a little bit. I'm not super attached to that idea either. You could maybe make it an optional thing you can disable if you want to, but it adds a little bit of depth to the combat because there's this sort of trade-off to sighting or not sighting, sighting or shooting from the hip, and that way the increased speed or the increased accuracy is viable, and if you add the slow time effect, the increased accuracy will remain viable at close range. It'll just kind of be more of a situational thing. And the only other thing that concerns me as far as the combat is you really need to either make ammo finite or remove those ammo boxes from the game world. And if you make ammo finite, there obviously needs to be a lot more of them. Of course, it's also possible, and I haven't tested this, I'm not sure I care enough to check, but it's also possible that the ammo boxes, like, cause the gun to do more damage or something, but like that's not really explicitly stated in the game, and I haven't checked, so I don't know. But if they do something, like, make it clear to the player what the heck they do. And if they're just a source of ammo, have there be more of them. Or literally, just have them spawn randomly. That's probably a better idea. You don't want to be able to softlock the game because you used all the ammo in the game. That would be annoying.
The puzzles are another issue I have. I'm not really sure exactly how to fix those. I'm not a huge connoisseur of uh, whatever this type of game is. From what I understand, Resident Evil games have a lot of puzzles that I probably also would personally dislike for basically the same reasons as I dislike this one, but I haven't played Resident Evil, so maybe they're more reasonable. But the puzzles in this game that I have played, I can speak to, seem needlessly just arbitrary and random and they're just kind of there for no reason it's like the player needs to do something in order to open this door so we're gonna have them arrange paintings on the walls what what so that doesn't make any sense to me personally maybe that's just common in this type of game and uh, it's just lost on me I, I don't know but I would say the puzzles they can be arbitrary if you want, but like have them be interesting to interact with and solve. Or they can be uninteresting if you want, but like have them not be arbitrary. Have them have some kind of grounding in the story or the world. I'm not sure what either of those would look like. Actually, I guess I know what one of those things would look like. So if you're going to make them completely arbitrary, make them interesting to solve. So Legend of Zelda games I am familiar with and I am a big fan of. If you look at the puzzles in Zelda games, a lot of them are pretty arbitrary. They're pretty just random. You have to, you know, push this button in order to open the door. Now, it's not quite as random as puzzles on the wall, but it can at times have the same kind of feel to it, where it's just like you have to arrange all of these things in the right order. But those puzzles are usually really fun and interesting to solve. And that has more to do with the puzzle design than the puzzle's place in the world. So that's what that would look like, is if it looked, I guess, more like something you see in a Zelda game, perhaps. That's pure speculation on my part. What would it look like for it to be just as boring, but have some, like, place in the story or the world? I have no idea. I, I haven't thought that far. Probably my two biggest gripes about the story itself. In my opinion, the worst things about it are the translation and the voice acting. You just, they needed to hire someone who spoke English fluently to fix their translation. That would have fixed a lot of the problems I have with the dialogue. Not all of them, but some. Most of the rest of the problems would have been fixed by getting voice actors who could be bothered to voice act. And that's pretty much it. Now, obviously, there's the whole context thing. There would still be a lot of stuff that wouldn't make sense, but that would be a huge improvement. So that brings us to the story itself and what I would do with this story in order to make it work in a game. And the answer is I'm not entirely sure, but I have some ideas here, so we'll get into them. As much as I complain about the zombies, I think I'm actually going to keep the zombies here. We're just going to forget about the historical origin of the term amok. We're going to forget about how it was used in the book. And we're just going to say, okay, let's pretend for a moment that it is just a zombie virus, right? Let's go a step further. I'm going to say, let's forget about the pregnancy. Well, then why is what's what's they're going? What's the story going to be? I think that in my version of this story, Linda comes to the doctor's clinic with this problem pregnancy but just like she's not feeling well she has these symptoms and they're not the symptoms of the zombie virus but like they're maybe similar and doctor checks her out in in a normal doctor sense right and finds no actually you do have the zombie virus but it looks like she's a healthy carrier of it so she has the disease and she can pass it on to other people, they can catch it from her, but she's not going to turn into a zombie, right? Maybe she's patient zero, maybe she just happens to be immune for some reason, whatever. Well, now we have a valid and sensible reason for her to run off because she doesn't want to be, you know, quarantined somewhere and studied. And we have a valid reason for the doctor to chase her because he doesn't want her infecting the whole town with this virus. So now he's going to go about trying to hunt her down. And I don't know the specifics of why he needs to go to like multiple different locations or whatever, but let's say he does. 
now as he goes to these locations he's going to be constantly trying to hunt her down and in the meantime you also want to expand these locations that the player is exploring make them more elaborate make them a little bit larger make there be more interesting puzzles more real information to uncover you're always looking for the next lead as to where she would have run next perhaps and while you're doing that there's gonna be these you know zombies coming after you because more and more people in the town keep getting infected right and so at that point you have an actual kind of plot thread and gameplay loop going on there and then what'll happen is after hunting her down going to the mansion she's not there anymore and then you find out she went to maybe she went to the city hospital thinking that maybe they would give a second opinion or something but when you get there the virus is spread out of control and it's infected everyone and now you have to like fight your way out of this hospital that's full of infected patients and maybe if you still wanted to have the police chase for some reason maybe you get out of the hospital and maybe the police show up at that exact moment as you get out of the hospital and they've been following you all night unbeknownst to you right and they just are they don't maybe they don't know about the virus or maybe they don't realize um, that that's what was going on. They just see that you've been leaving this trail of dead bodies behind you all night and they've been trying to catch up to you. So they finally do at that moment. They find you coming out of the hospital full of dead people and they're like, oh crap. Oh crap, he's on a rampage. We gotta stop this guy. So then, you know, they're not gonna listen to reason. You have to hop in your car and make a break for it. And I I'm not sure why they don't stop you from getting on the boat, but let's say they don't or let's say you manage to sneak past them or something maybe there's like a stealth segment of the the game there that would be kind of interesting and then at that point we're gonna flash back to on the boat where like i guess our story started but instead of learning that a coffin was put on the boat or something the doctor starts to have symptoms of the virus and he's like oh no oh no I'm sick now and I'm gonna kill everyone on this ship if I stay here. So then it might be perfectly reasonable that he would jump overboard in order to save everybody else. And on top of that, then you have an actually heroic character to some, ex some extent, rather than what we got in this game. Yeah, I think that might be, that might work. There, there are probably a couple plot holes here and there, but I think that makes a more interesting and more compelling story for just like a cheap horror game at least than whatever they did in a muck runner so that's my attempt at fixing it i'm not sure how it well it works but i uh, hope you guys enjoyed oh one last thing if you're ever in for a really good laugh go to gamedeus.com it's the uh it's the website for the developer of amok runner and the whole site is has nothing to do with the developer it's just dedicated to this one game i was gonna cover it in this video but now i'm thinking you know what i don't really have anything constructive to say about that and i feel like i've been mean enough to these devs already but check it out sometime if you're on a good laugh read some of the text blocks they got on there watch the trailer for the game it's just a good time it's so horrendous anyway i think that's gonna do it for this video if you by some miracle are still watching this video at this point thank you so much you are awesome i hope you had as much fun watching this as i did making it and hey if this interested you enough to stick around this long maybe consider subscribing i can't guarantee i'll bring you stuff that you'll find interesting but i can guarantee that i will continue to bring you stuff that i find interesting and you know hopefully some of you guys will as well I'd like to thank you all very much for your time, good people of Earth. I am Zoltar of Zanduin, and I wish you all a very pleasant day. Bye-bye.